Heavenly Father, thank you for today that we can come together and study uh, and worship uh, and community together uh, as fellow Christians. Please be with us as we continue to go through the book of Revelation. Uh, please bring your Holy Spirit and, and keep us uh, out of the ditches. Uh, keep us in your truth. And help us to understand the, the magnificence of, of your plan through Jesus to save um, uh, and redeem this broken world uh, you know, that desperately needs it. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. All right, welcome, everybody. Um, again, there you go. So um, if anybody's got any questions, just take yourself off of mute and ask them um, at any time uh, feel you're not going to be interrupted so just if i'm mid-sentence feel free to just jump right in and i will stop and you can ask your question or make your comment um let's so today we're we're in chapter five last week we did chapter four um and or the the first you know, the first few chapters of Revelation you know, were, were kind of Jesus's self-disclosure um, to us about who he is. Uh, and then, you know, he dictates the letters to the seven churches, which are to all ages, uh, Christians of all age in the church age. Um, um, and, you know, now we're actually kind of getting into the the meat of the I'll call it prophecy, but it's, we go backwards and forwards on this. And we'll see a little bit of that in chapter five uh, today. You know, so the, you know, what we're, what we're looking at is not only what's going to take place in the future, it's what's already taken place in the past sometimes um, and taking place in the present as well. So um, from a technical perspective, we're in John's second vision Um you know, his first was Jesus' self-identification in the seven letters. So this is the, we're still in the, the second vision here. Um, chapter four relates to, related to God and his creation. And chapter five uh, talks about the lamb and redemption. So that's, so our focus will, sh you know, shift over to, um, back to Jesus. We went from focus on Jesus in the first three chapters and then a little more focus on the Father and the Spirit. And then now chapter five, we'll be swinging back to really focus on the Lamb uh, in Christ. Um, and just from a, you know, the purpose again, just to state the purpose of Revelation is to give God's people comfort in the midst of persecution, strife, turmoil, and the trouble that all of us have in this broken world. Um, and to, to, to tell us that he's coming and that he's coming soon. And for us to, to persevere. I mean, that's what we're called to do, to, to persevere, um, have faith in him and stay the course. We stay the course, we're good. Um, and that, that vision we saw in chapter four you know, God's we're, you know, God's at the center of the universe. Um, and that picture of the throne room, I just want to remind everybody that, you know, it's an image. It's an image of his power and rule and majesty. Um, and just like we, when we talk about tonight in chapter five, we talk about a scroll. Um, again, the scroll is an image. Um, you know, there's not a, um, you know, there's, you, know, you can't, we can't picture Jesus really taking a scroll out of the Father's hand. You know, this is an image of what has been the, you know, the power and the, um, and everything Jesus needs to complete the plan of redemption um, that God started through him. So again, let's, let's kind of keep that poetic side of our brain active and not just, and not just fall into, you know, thinking that the image we, images we see are something we could actually point to and touch if we were standing next to next to John, if that makes sense. Um, okay, well, let's 
jump right in and, and get started. So, Sue, you want to read uh, chapter five for us? Sure. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scrolls and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Thanks, Sue. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one again chapter five is packed um so hopefully we can do justice to to this chapter in 54 minutes 53 52 minutes sorry um so there, there's some links and commonalities between chapter four and chapter five um we have the, the he who sits on the throne uh, we have the four living creatures the 24 elders um the falling down and worshiping um and the the talk of you know who is worthy um and talk about creation so so there's a lot of you know a lot of commonalities between chapter four and chapter five because they build on each other and if you remember from last time um that we said that the 24 elders were representative of redeemed humanity that's who they represent um so again trying to get away from picturing 24 folks sitting on thrones in the middle of the universe. Uh, we're just, we're trying to get the image of what's being um, said here. And so it's the, these 24 elders representing redeemed humanity um, and the four living creatures representing, um, representing um, angelic beings that do God's bidding, um, not the fallen ones, the, the, the ones that that stayed the course um and the with falling down and worshiping um you know that that the that majesty of god and the, how everybody is um in wonder and awe on what god has done um you know it's, it which is where we should be and and awe of 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 you know the father the holy spirit and jesus on what they have done for us um yeah well yes. when we don't deserve it so it, it really is a um yeah, a, a, an amazing thing um when we think about this and also we we lead up to um you know the, as we go through chapter five you know i used to i used to punt you know think about you know wow is, is jesus really the only possible way um to, to, to have the relationship with God fixed that was broken during the fall. Um, and, you know, the reading through chapter five, it, it, there's no equivocation in that answer is absolutely. Yes. 
Jesus is the only way. He is the way. Um, so um, there, there's a lot of, actually, there's a lot of comfort in that, a ton of comfort in that. Um, so the, the lamb occupies the center of all of God's decrees. Everything focuses now on the lamb. So, you know, throughout the rest of the, the rest of the book of Revelation, you know, it's, it's all about Jesus. Um, you know, he's worthy. He's able to break the seals, open the scroll, again, the image of what that represents. And nothing comes to pass apart from the lamb. Um, both creation and redemption begin and end with him. Um, and, you know, that, I know I'm kind of beating the horse on this one, but, um, you know, the lamb, that's an image also. Um, you know, we shouldn't be picturing Jesus having wool and four legs. You know, again, it's an image. It's a sacrificial image of what he's done on our behalf. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be saying this every day, I know, through the balance of this year and, and half of next year. So bear with me, not trying to be too obnoxious about it. Um, so first, let's talk about the scroll. I mean, that's a, I mean, this is a, it's an, it's an important issue in the book of Revelation because it starts every, it starts everything. It starts the, um, it really starts with um, Jesus's ascension and goes all the way through to his second coming. So and and, I, and that's really important to to get our foundation set. So let's talk a little bit about the scroll first. The appearance of the scroll. It was written on the inside and the back, so it's written on both sides. Typically, scrolls were only written on one side. Um, scroll. Um, so, but sometimes scrolls were written written on both. But the image here with writing on the inside and the back it it symbolizes the. Not, not only the volume of the message, but the magnitude of the message as well. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion in the commentaries about it. Is it a scroll or a codex? Uh, a codex is um, looks like a scroll, but it can be opened individually. Like um, with, for example, the first seal, you can undo the first seal and then open it up and read part of the thing, the um, what's in the document. But, you know, repeatedly, we, it says scroll, scroll, scroll. So we're going to, you know, so most of the commentaries go back. No, it's not a codex. It's a scroll. All seven seals have to be open before the scroll can be read. And again, it's an image. As there's no, Jesus isn't sitting up there flicking open scrolls, open the, you know, he's the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's an image of him having the power, the ability and the status to be able to do this, and, and we'll we'll flesh that out in a second. Um, just an interesting word: um, a scroll with writing on both sides is called an epistograph. So that's our twenty-five cent word for today: mm -hmm. epistograph. Um, in Ezekiel, we've seen um, there was a scroll in Ezekiel as well that had uh, um, writing on the front and back as well. Um, it's Ezekiel chapter two, verses nine and 10. And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me and it had writing on the front and on the back. And there were written on it words of lamentation, mourning and woe. So, but the difference between the scroll that Ezekiel sees and the scroll that John sees and that Jesus takes out of the hand of the father is that the scroll, Ezekiel scroll wasn't sealed. It was rolled open for him to look. Um, the scroll is sitting in the right hand of God is sealed. Um, only the lamb is able to take the one in John's vision. So in the, all right. And so the message of the scroll, what does the scroll represent? Um, you know, there's a lot, there's a ton of discussion on that. Um, some people say it's the unfolding of all remaining history um, after Jesus's ascension. Um, other people say, well, it's, it's specifically the unfolding of the plan of redemption, uh, after the ascension. And then other people say that it's just an unfolding of judgment upon the earth right at the end time, right, 
you know, right at the end time. Um, and so it hasn't, so it, so it hasn't, it hasn't started yet. Um, basically everything that, you know, going through, crawling through all of this, it doesn't make sense for, um, for this to, to not have, to not have happened yet. Um, it makes sense. It makes sense to me that, that the scroll is God's plan of redemption being unveiled um, by Christ. Um, and because of the plan of redemption, I think that does encompass the, you know, the kind of how the, everything's going to shake out in history because all of it plays together. You know, God's the author of history. Um, now just another, uh, the 10 commandments had um, writing on both the front and the back as well. So there's that sense of completeness. And so it is with the scroll. Um, it's that complete plan for the culmination of history. Um, that culminates with the second coming of Jesus. Um, and the scroll line in God's hand implies that he's the author of it. Um, and that's true. He's the author of history. And Jesus is like the mediator, executor of history. Um, okay. And the seals, it's... Um, you know, we the you know, who can open it? Only only Jesus can open, it. and we'll talk about why in a second. Um, so you know, the scroll with its seals, evidence of what God has planned for the salvation of his people. Um, and that that if y'all remember from Ephesians, you know, we talk about the Paul talks about the mystery of God, that you know, God's mysterious plan. In Ephesians 1, verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. So this plan coming about in the fullness of time. Uh, in Ephesians 3, to me, this is Paul speaking, to me, though, I am very, I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness, boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So, that, you know, the mystery, you know, that mystery is bringing salvation using the Jewish people to bring salvation to the whole world. And to and to, and so, you know, God's the fullness of God's plan. Um, bringing in the Gentiles as well with the Jewish people being, um, you know, kind of the bringers of that and the bringer of, you know, how Jesus comes to become incarnate and become one of us. Um, And you know, so God's plan of salvation is coming of his kingdom to contest Satan's rule and to proclaim God as the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come to establish his kingdom. You know, therefore, you know, I conclude that the contents of the scroll pertain to God's secret purpose of establishing his kingdom on earth until the fullness of his glory is revealed with the second coming of Christ. Um so the the seven seals, you know, the wording the wording is interesting, and with the seven seals, um, you know, the opening of the scroll is mentioned first, and then the breaking of the seals, and I don't think we should get hung up on that. The 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 um, you know the the purpose of the seals is that only Jesus is is able and capable, um, qualified. Qualified is probably a better word than able qualified to open the scroll and complete God's plan. Um, 
in it, the the scroll we've got seven seven seals representing completeness that the scroll is completely sealed it's purposely sealed it's specially sealed um Right, we'll dig a little bit deeper into 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 that in a second, but just wanted to start off with, you know, trying to to get a definition of of what that scroll is. Um. So back to the the text. Then, so we have. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll. So it's in the right hand of the Father, um, and a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, proclaiming. So it's not proclaimed, um. It's proclaiming. So there's an ongoing sense of, of that mighty angel, you know, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. Um, just for notes, uh, mighty angels mentioned three times in Revelation. Here's the first time. And then in chapter 10 and chapter 18, mighty angels mentioned again. So the and a word on proclaiming, you know, the, the mighty angel continued to call for anyone to step up to the throne of God. Um, the implication seems to be that nobody touched by sin from a human perspective could approach the throne. Only those worthy can approach. Um, and that God, you know, we have, you know, when we, when we see, you know, I always, when I say he who sits on the throne, I always think of God the Father. In, in this, but we have God the Father, really, he who sits on the throne really is representing the Trinity, you know, God the Trinity. So, link that one out there too. Um, and worthy does not mean able. It's it's relates to the qualifications for the purpose of fulfilling a task. Um, And one one commentator said that you know John sees the opening of the scrolls scroll before the seals are broken, and perhaps that's an image of showing that the task is not merely the breaking of the seals, but the effective control of the consequences of those actions. So it's not only can Jesus open the scroll and and complete that that plan of. Um, redemption for humanity but he also um you know controls everything controls all the consequences of that action so it's it's again it's god's god's in complete control of this um you know we're not being blown around by the wind um and this is not uh the evil one in control of of revelation this is god in control bringing things to a culminating purpose All right. And John, and verse four, and I, John, um, began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And, you know, another, you know, to me, that's another pointer um, that, that when the scrolls open, it's a, it's a, it's a glorious event. It's a glorious event um, to be, on that path toward God completing his plan of salvation for human for broken humanity to put in not only to put an end to all the suffering um but to bring justice to, to pass judgment and bring justice and that's and and you know that's what the saints in front of the throne have been calling for how much how much longer oh lord um and they're told just wait just wait it's coming it, it's coming. It's sure, and it's coming. Um, and the angels calling to all, um, all parts of creation. No one in heaven, or on earth, or under the earth is able to open the scroll. Now, that's not just a, a pagan, the classic pagan way of looking at the world. You know, heaven, earth, and then below. Um, it's whole earth, all creation. Not just the, you know, all the, the whole universe, um, out of the whole universe of all creation, um, there's only one being that can, that can fulfill God's plan, and that's Jesus. Um, 
Yeah, no mere cute, no mere creature, no whether it's a angel or a human, no mere creature can sustain the burden of God's eternal wrath against sin and deliver others from it. So who can open it? Um, and one of the elders, you know, so one of the rep, you know, redeemed humanity, one of the representatives of redeemed humanity said, weep no more to John. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Um, yeah, there's with the, with both the um, a couple of things to note here: um, the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David are both um, are. Um, you know, both have messianic overtones. Um, in Genesis uh, 49, uh, verse 9, uh, start, Judah is a lion's cub. And this is where um, Jacob, Israel, was blessing um, the blessing his sons right before his death when they were still in Egypt. So Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not part, depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of peoples. So, you know, Jesus is conquered. Um, being the Messiah, he's conquered. Um and that conquering the term, you know, Jesus has conquered is a direct link back to the letters of the, to the seven churches. In 2, 7, Jesus is, um, in chapter 2, verse 7, Jesus has conquered Satan and borne the full burden of the wrath of God. And Jesus as conqueror is worthy to break the seals and unroll the document. As the author of salvation, he received the honor and distinction to take the scroll out of God's hand and open it. Um, just a little bit more messianic old testament quotes just to so, so we can kind of ponder these as we as we move forward and as isaiah 11 starting with verse 1 there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit and the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the lord and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness, the belt of his loins. Uh, in Jeremiah 23, Start. Um, this is start with verse three. Some more messianic prophecy out of the Old Testament. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel, out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then they shall dwell in their own land. I, I think this is clearly um, talking about um, the the new Israel, believing Jewish people, believing Gentiles as the new Israel, um, and no longer hearkening back to being taken out of Egypt. It's now being taken out of every tribe and nation on earth and being made, being, how about being made alive? The, the dead, that, this is what makes Christianity 
completely different than any other religion. It's not, it's not God or uh, the power making bad people good. It's making dead people alive. That's what Christianity does. That's what Jesus does. It makes he br- makes people come back from the dead. Um, and I'm not talking. I'm not talking just. I'm not talking physical death. I'm talking being dead inside. Um, you know, which is what be- before we accepted Christ, we were dead in our sins. Um, and that's what that's what Jesus does for us. He brings us back from the dead. Um, I didn't, and there's a, some more in Zechariah 3, but y'all, y'all can read that later. So as a descendant of David, Jesus is human. And as Messiah, as Messiah he is divine. You know, it's just showing the two natures of Christ, um, you know, a God nature and a human nature. Um, and he's the real lion and the real lamb. Um, you know, Jesus is worthy because of his role as mediator mediator of the new covenant between God and man and is able and he's able because of his divinity you know he's the God man the one and only the alpha and the omega um and let's Okay. Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David is conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to, into all the earth. So we've, again, we've got that picture of of completeness. Um and the you know the completeness not only of uh, God the Father but the completeness of the Holy Spirit as well and the completeness of the Lamb um, and nothing nothing misses um, their observation they miss nothing they're they're aware of everything that's going on um, and so just the imagery the I saw a Lamb standing. Interesting terminology with the lamp, you know, standing um, as though it had been slain. Yeah, so that, um, you know, so just trying to actually picture um, picture this is probably is not worth not not worth the time. What's worth the time is what does this mean? Um, you know, the so we're talking about the sacrificial nature of Christ, what He did for us on on our behalf that we didn't deserve. Um, that he that he conquered not only conquered conquered death and therefore conquered sin as well. Um, he took the wrath of God all on his own. You know, he's the only one that was capable of doing that. Um, took on the sins of the whole world. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So, I, I, you know, who in the world can take something out of the hand of God? Well, Jesus can. God himself can. Um, and so we have very active, like, and he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. So worshiping him, Christ deserves worship. Christ is God. Um, just like the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, they 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 compose God. That's one being. There's three persons, one being. Um, and uh, you know the twenty four elders falling down, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Um, let's see. So back back to the back to the notes on um. Oh, but before we get back to the notes, so so Jesus takes that scroll from the hand of the Father, and so so when do you think this incident occurred? Um, 
it makes sense to me that it didn't occur before his incarnation. It makes sense that it occurred after the incarnation, um, death on the cross, and resurrection, and the ascension. So, you know, remember when Jesus said, "All you know, all authority upon, on heaven and earth has been given to him." Um, from my perspective, this is kind of what that means. That he's been given all authority and power um, to continue to bring God's plan of salvation for mankind to, to fruition. Um, so there's, you know, I, so I, I there's, there's that, again, I come back to um, premillennial dispensationalism would say it hasn't happened yet. I, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I know that's not a good um, not a good measure. What makes sense to me is not a good measuring stick for truth. I know that. But just from looking at the evidence, um, you know, when Jesus ascended to the throne, the, the, the right hand of God, he's the he's the author of our salvation. He's the one carrying out the plan and he's coming again. So, you know, the the ability to take the scroll says that, that, you know, Jesus has finished his work. His work is completed. Um, and Father hands it, you know, Father hands authority over to Jesus. So I think that's what this is an image of. Um, and traditionally, and I say traditionally, this historically the church has always has always said that it wasn't until the 1800s that we kind of that we split off and have a big chunk of people believing um, in an in another interpretation of Revelation. Um, we all end up in the same spot, though. It's not a it's not a so I don't want to think that they'll end up in some you know some god awful interpretation that. Um, no, we all end up in the same place. Jesus comes, puts everything right, um, and the new heavens and the new earth come, and um, death done away with, no tears, um, Satan and his minions thrown into hell. You know, that's in any interpretation, that's how it ends up. So it's just how we get there. Um, but any questions on that? I, I, I know I've kind of nibble at that pretty much every every week we're here so um okay it's just another caution of being we can't be too rigid in our timeline when we're reading the book of revelation because what I, the um the classic interpretation of chapter 5 and chapter 6 is that some of it's already occurred, some of it's occurring today, and some of it will occur in the future. And we'll flesh that out when we get to chapter six. So but, um, let's see, we said seven spirits um, relate to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Um, both father and son commission the spirit to go forth into all the earth. That's in John chapter 14. The Holy Spirit makes known the Son of God and his message of redemption in all parts of the world. Um, to remember in the New Testament several times, um, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ because that's the, the function, the, the, I say function, I think they call it the economy or administration. Um, so the Holy Spirit makes known the Son of God and his message of redemption in all parts of the world. Um, and you know, Jesus is at God's right hand. Um, you know, the right hand in those days, the right hand was the good hand. Um, the, the, like I said, the living creatures and the elders immediately fall down and worship the lamb. So something's changed now because we have a new song. Um, um, verse nine, and they sang a new song. Um, this is the elders before the throne saying a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language and people and nation. That's mentioned four times 
in Revelation. Tribe, language, people, and nation. Um, you know, for just think four cardinal points of the compass. That's you know that the whole earth is what that's kind of you know, getting people ransoming people out of the whole earth um, from every tribe, language, people, nation. Another example, another reason that um, that racism is foolish. Um, you know, we are all created in the image of God. There is no, um, in front of God, there is no black, white, yellow, red. There's no, we're, we're, we're humanity, fallen humanity, fallen humanity, and then redeemed humanity, and then unredeemed humanity. It's a subset of that. That's, so the subset is, is not your, you know, it's not if you're Irish, it's not if you're Scottish, it's not if you're German, Russian, Ukrainian. The subset is you're either part of the redeemed humanity or you're not. That those are the two groups. Okay. So, so something's changed now that after, and it makes it does make sense that Jesus is first kind of the incarnation. Um, you know, it's a it's a universe shattering event. God has God has become man and entered his creation um, and become one of us. Uh, and then he performed his mission um, sinlessly. Um, you know, he's the beloved son and did everything that the father required of him. And this was the plan um, before all creation. This was the plan from day one. Um, but Jesus stepped up, fulfilled his role um, in, in the perfection um, that is his. Um, okay. Yeah, so the universe is different now. Um, you know, it's God's taken a significant step forward to the consummation of all things. And that's that's another reason why it's, you know, the time is short. The time is short. Um, the second coming is at hand. Um, and I know it's been said that way for the last 2000 years. Um, but we as Christians, that's what we're supposed to to hold, you know, that that time is short. And, you know, the second, you know, Jesus, the kingdom is at hand and the second coming is right around the corner. Even it might be a thousand years from now, it might be a year from now. Um, but but it's it's that it's part of this new song. Um, and the the classic view is that his ascension is where he mm -hmm. received the authority to rule the universe. Um, Hebrews two verse eight kind of seems to back that up. Um, you know, and what is this new song? It's the song of redemption. Um, and we see election here as well. I just thought we should mention it. Um, let's see. And you, uh, verse nine, from every, um, you have ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He has ransomed his elect. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion of did did Christ die for all or for only, only the elect? Um, you know, the effect is, is that you know, he's only dying for the elect. But every, you know, everybody can, you know, it's all anybody has to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Um, but there is some, you know, there, there is this process of election and I can't really, probably not the time and place to try to explain that, but I did want to mention it because it, it shows Jesus choosing people out of every tribe, nation around the earth. Um, it's worldwide in scope, embraces every group, every every ethnic tribe, every linguistic, every every different tongue, um, 
political, social, it doesn't matter. It, um, and together, all the redeemed constitute a kingdom. Um, we're a kingdom and we're priests. Um, so we can actually kind of picture Jesus you know, accepting the accepting the office of king of the universe once he took the scroll. Um, and then the throne becomes the throne of God and the lamb. God governs the universe through the lamb. It can be viewed as the mediator's investiture within the off, with the office of king of the year over the universe. Um, so you know, Jesus is still our mediator. That's, that's a key role because, you know, the, Believers are in Christ, and being in Christ, that's how we access the Father. That's how things are made whole. Um, that's the entrance to the sheepfold. Go, that's the gate. Jesus is the gate to the sheepfold. Um, can't climb over the wall. Get in trouble climbing over the wall. Um, and so we have three hymns coming up. Um, in, in verse 9, um, starts, worthy are you to take the scroll, and then um, worthy is the lamb in, ver in verse 12, who is slain, and then in verse 13, to him who sits on the throne, and to the lamb. So we have three, um, three different songs, um, three different hymns. Uh, the elders sing first, the angels sing second, and all creatures sing the third one. Um, let's see, I mentioned that. And it, this is the 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 songs here are really short, um, kind of encapsulation of the gospel. Um, so let's just kind of read through. Let me read through the 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 different songs again. Worthy are you to take the scroll. And to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, and from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all and all the four living and the four living creatures said Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Um you know, there's a, a lot of um listening to a couple of podcasts today, um, discussions with uh, atheist and apologist and the one of the party line on atheist is, you know, Jesus never called himself God in the New Testament, which is not true. Um, but here's demonstrated, you know, he's accepting worship. Who accepts worship? Not, not creatures. Only God accepts worship. Um, and the land, you know, Jesus isn't going, oh, well, wait, guys, I'm just like you. None of that. He's accepting the worship. It is his due. It is his. Um, he is he is worthy. He is right to receive um, to receive that worship. But I think the image of the the scroll, you know, is that that bringing redemptive history to a close. And and that's what Jesus is on the throne with. You know, with the Father and the Holy Spirit accomplishing that uh, for us, um, and sorry, guys, I lost my train of thought. I was coming to a really important statement. Oh, yeah, about opening this, you know, that that opening the scroll is making the content a reality. So again, let's if we just try to, you know, the the scroll representing um the the completion of God's plan of redemption. Um and that's what everybody with the not only not not only the it's angel the angels, 
the elders that are representing redeemed humanity, John, it's everybody's excited and enthusiastic about, um, you know, Jesus being able to take this and complete God's plan of redemption um, for humanity. Um, so, I, so this is, you know, I said at the at the beginning, I, I just, um, I don't see how anybody can read Revelation, even read the first five chapters and think that there's another way um, to, to fix our relationship, our broken relationship with God because of sin other than through Jesus. From, from my perspective, just these five chapters alone nail that one and put that to bed. So in, in these two chapters, chapters four and five, we see the entire universe governed by the throne. That is by God through the Lamb. Um, and we saw that in the, the Ephesians reading that, that we did a little bit ago. Um, any any questions before I kind of start going through and kind of closing this thing out for this evening? All right. Well, if something comes to your mind, jump in. Um, you know, just a, a little more, a little, just a little more commentary. The the Lamb slain to redeem His people. Oh, I hold on. There you go. I saw something I missed. Oh. And I don't know what page this is on, guys, but um, it's it's one of the general observations going forward. John is shedding, I, I had like John I shedding tears. John is shedding tears that the scroll cannot be opened. Points to the scroll being God's key to the redemption for humanity. Without the scroll being opened, the plan of salvation cannot move for, toward its fulfillment. I left it at can. So sorry, that's significant. It cannot move toward its fulfillment. You know, the curse of death and the bondage of sin will remain. Um, so creation will not be set free from the bondage of decay and suffering. It would last in, interminably or forever. Um, if, if Jesus wasn't the one to finish this out for us. Okay, um, so the lamb slain to redeem his people symbolizes the voluntary sacrifice of the crucified Christ. Again, trying to talk about the image of the lamb. The voluntary sacrifice of the crucified Christ and at the same time, the supremacy of the exalted Christ. Um, and we'll see later, one of the heads of the beast coming up out of the sea was slain um, as, a, as a parody of Jesus' death, as a counterfeit of Jesus' death. Uh, the difference is that Christ rose from the dead while the beast is consigned eternally to the lake of fire. By shedding his life blood and dying on the cross, Jesus paid for the sins of his people and set them free. By contrast, the beast, having suffered a fatal blow to one of his seven heads, enslaves his followers and continues to attack God, his name, his dwelling place, and his people. Christ Jesus brought, bought his people with his blood shed at Calvary at the cross. He did not pay Satan to redeem them, but with his death on the cross, he satisfied the justice of God. He paid the penalty that God had placed on Adam and Eve and their descendants and set them free, he delivers us from the curse. Uh, God's people owe Jesus an overwhelming debt for his willingness to pay the price for our redemption. Um, anyway, so I think the um, let's see if there's anything else I scribbled down here. Oh, you know, we talked about the um, the Lion of Judah and the the uh, root of Jesse, uh, the root of David. Um, so we're, we're thinking the you know we we have that picture of the image in our head of lion and. Now, all of a sudden, what do we see? We see a lamb. So it's so it's the lamb. You know, it's not just the the 
you know, the, the, the mighty warrior type thing is God. It's a reminder that God conquers through, um, through weakness. Um, uh, he, he, he works things out in a way that, that, you know, the, um, that, that looks like foolishness to, to mankind. So, you know, he so working through weakness is, is what our Lord does. Um, which is amazing because we are incredibly weak and unable. Um, he's the one who's got to work through a weakness to get it done. But it's, um, it's just it's staggering to even think about it like that. Um, anyway, I think, guys, that's about all I had for this evening. Um, just from a schedule standpoint, we'll do next Tuesday. Um, Don, you had mentioned that on the 19th, there might be another event going yeah, the on. Strikes um, are doing a dinner at, uh, some, uh, at a restaurant at the beach. I don't know what, I don't know which one it is. Okay. But... Well, um, I don't want to, don't want to compete with anything, um, but think about it and we can talk about it next week that, you know, if, if people weren't, if, if people weren't planning to attend or couldn't attend that um, that event, um, that we we could meet the nineteenth and just talk. Y'all could ask questions, and you know it allow it would allow me a little time to 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 lay out um, some of the different interpretations that I that I you know not going to be hitting too hard in each hour session over the next um, few months. Um, because I don't want to derail what we're trying to do. Um, so it might be a, a chance, an opportunity just to talk about um, some of the other interpretations of Revelation. So, but anyway, we can think about that. But next week we'll do chapter six. Um, it will not finish the opening of the seals, but it'll allow us to um, to kind of really finish getting the foundation set so we can complete Revelation um, with, um, with, with what I think is the, the best way to look at this as more of a cycle approach leading to the, leading to a culmination at the end. All right. Um, let's see, Marie, you want to close us out in prayer? Click yourself off mute first. There you go. Perfect. Thanks, Marie. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, thank you for letting us learn more about you tonight in one of the most misunderstood books of the Bible. Thank you for Jeff, who's guiding us through this at this special time of the year. We have a lot of sickness as we anticipate your your, your birth, Lord. It seems like during Advent each year, we have sickness, we have grief. We have so many things going on that we forget what's important, and, and that's you, Lord. You are the center of this universe. Help us, Lord, to remember the ones that are not here tonight, especially Bob Fay, who is having surgery this week, and especially Lori, who is going through another surgery real soon. We just ask that you be with them at, at this special time of the year. It is tough when you're going through these trials and that you feel alone, but yet, Lord, you're in control of all of these things. We have doctors to heal us, but those doctors' hands are guided by you. Now, Lord, help us to go out and be better stewards of your word, your love, peace and we thank you for your mercy and grace and may the sweet fragrance of that mercy and grace be with each one of us of us here tonight and through the coming days and through your word help us be the best christians spreading your word giving sunshine when there's darkness it's in your name we pray amen thanks Marie. all right guys we'll see you guys uh, next tuesday Bye.